This is uh, Kevin Thompson. I'd like to welcome you to the Davis McGrath LLC IP webinar series for March 7, 2012. Uh, today's topic is trademarks and domain names. Uh, the recording and slides will be posted at the address shown on your screen, which is blog.davismcgrath.com forward slash webinars. Uh, you can also sign up for our webinar, webinar mailing list there. And uh, for those of you in Illinois who need MC Elite credit, um, uh, we are currently seeking half an hour of MCLE credit for this presentation. And uh, if you have not already uh, sent me your ARDC number for uh, credit, uh, please send that to me. Also, uh, credit should be available for those who watch the recording. So uh, if you do watch the recording and have questions or um, would like Illinois credit, uh, uh, please contact me by email. Um, our next webinar is coming up on April 4th, 2012, from about, again, for about half an hour from 12 to 12.30 on copyright ownership issues. So today we're going to go for about 30 minutes and uh, provide a, just a real brief overview of trademarks, a uh, real brief overview of domain names and their formats. And then we're going to talk a little bit about domain names as trademarks and then also about domain names that include trademarks and uh, talk about um, some of the methods that are used to handle uh, disputes such as Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy, the UDRP, and the Anti-Cyber Squatting Consumer Protection Act, which is ACPA. And then if we have time, we're going to go through some hypotheticals, uh, going through uh, some examples of applications of these. Um, should be a lot of fun. Uh, this is something I could certainly do for a lot longer, so we'll see how far I can get through uh, in 30 minutes here. Um, trademarks in general are symbols used in commerce to identify the source of particular goods or services. Uh, many states have their own trademark laws, uh, but there are federal, there is federal protection available. Uh, the United States Patent and Trademark Office uh, allows you to register trademarks that are used in interstate commerce. Now, domain names are a human readable string of letters and numbers that translate a web address into the numbers that computers behind the scenes need to actually use to access a web address. So for example, we might think of google.com as the domain name, uh, whereas uh, my computer tells me that google.com is actually 74.125.224.162. So um, if I know that particular string of numbers, I can certainly type that in and be taken to google.com or I can simply remember that google.com is where I want to go, type that in and it takes me there. Um, domain names are more than just web addresses. Uh, they can be used uh, as uniform resource locators uh, for uh, pointing uh, people to particular services and also um, can be used as email addresses. So just because uh, somebody's registered domain name doesn't necessarily mean they're not using it. Uh, it could be used uh, for, for email or some other service. Uh, just briefly, uh, domain name formats. When we talk about uh, a domain name, you, you start at the far right and work your way to the left. Um, and what you see on the far right is the top level domain, the TLD, which is usually .com, .net, .org, and .biz, and uh, many, many others. There's uh, even country code domains that are uh, uh, in, in vogue. Uh, every country has their own domain, such as United States, which is .us. Um, uh, there are others that are being used that way, such as .co. And now currently ICANN is currently uh, accepting bids for new custom TLDs. Uh, costs a lot of money uh, and you know nobody knows exactly who has applied for them yet, but uh, uh, we'll find out in the next month or so uh, who has applied for those and uh, we'll see. Um, so to the left of that is the dot and then there's the domain name string, which is the name of the domain is selected by the registrant. Um, the domain name formats, uh, top level domains again are in the far right, the dot, domain name string, but then you can add a certain level of, of complexity to that uh, by 
looking at uh, what's even farther to the left of the domain name string, which are subdomains, which are strings to the left of the domain name string. It's part of the hierarchy. Uh, it could be a machine or it could be a directory name. So for example, uh, a common thing you might see if you go to, to Gmail would be mail.google.com, um, which is th their mail service. There is, um, you can have up to 127 different levels uh, for a total of 253 characters. It's a, a, so it can be quite complex. Uh, looks like I've already got a question. Um, the, how much do the uh, top-level domains cost? Oh goodness, um, I believe that over 200,000 is the app, just merely the application fee, and uh, the uh, cost it, estimated cost of of uh, becoming one of these is is estimated uh, over a million dollars, um, and uh, th that's just you know the startup costs in in becoming a, a a uh, your own custom dot top level domain, and um, uh, we'll have to see uh, how they pan out. Uh, but that's certainly where they estimate that to be. So, uh, when the next topic I want to get into is domain names as trademarks. Uh, the trademark office uh, again it it registers marks that are source identifiers. And so the United States Patent and Trademark Office, or USPTO, requires trademarks con that consist of domain names to be used as more than just an address. And it should be noted that a portion of the URL, such as the HTTP colon slash slash portion, the www portion, uh, which by the way doesn't have to be there, but many people do just more as, as form function, um, or that the TLDs such as .com search, uh, serve no source identifying function themselves. And so we're going to look at uh, some aspects of, of th that policy. Um, look at domain names as trademarks. I wanted to give you a good example. Uh, look at Amazon.com. Uh, they do a pretty good job of uh, incorporating the, 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 the name as a as part of it's part of the part of the, the source identifier, so the .com portion uh, is um, considered, uh, you know, part of it, part of the Amazon name, and uh, you know they they used uh, such phrases like you know Kevin's Amazon .com. If you look, uh, I've got my my pointer pointing there, and um, you know it's used more than just as as the web address. It's definitely a source identifying function here. Um, some interesting applications of this is uh, adding a top-level domain to a normally non-registrable element will, will make it registrable. Uh, for example, uh, the patents.com, which was litigated, and so was, was lawyers.com, and I've got the case sites there. Um, and uh, in, in both cases, um, you know, since they were advertising patent-related services or lawyers-related services, uh, it, it, they were uh, generic and uh, you know adding a just merely adding the top level domain to that element won't make it registrable um, and I do note that I believe that, that that result will likely change with the new custom TLDs uh, because those certainly will be source identifiers um, and uh, or at least could be uh, as envisioned by ICANN so we'll have to see how that pans out but uh, you know that certainly may change now, you certainly can get, uh, as part of these strings, uh, that domain names include trademarks. Uh, it's uh, hard to uh, envision a, a design mark that's used in this fashion, but we're certainly word marks are um, amenable to this, in which the domain name string incorporates all or part of somebody's trademark. So, for example, Coca-Cola could have registered Coca-Cola.com, uh, but, for example, if that was not available, they could have also used uh, coca-cola.taste.com, you know, merely incorporating the Coca-Cola trademark element as, uh, you know, one of the, one of the machine names uh, or uh, sub-subdomain names. And um, those are certainly uh, some simple examples. Um, 
but this is where you get into uh, the potential for disputes where somebody may register something as a domain name but they don't necessarily have the trademark rights for that and so that's when uh, we get into the dispute resolution policies uh, the uniform dispute resolution policy is administered by ICANN which is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers it's uh, the organization that uh, uh, is it sort of controls or directs uh, uh, the, the, the status of the Internet uh, the Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy itself uh, can be found at this particular address on uh, the ICANN website. Uh, there are plenty of other places to get a copy of it. Um, there's three important elements here, and uh, it should be noted that when you register a domain name, uh, you in agree to uh, this particular resolution policy as part of the registration process. It um, uh, there are uh, similar policies for other domain names as well. So uh, just because you register something through a particular country doesn't mean you're not part of the UDRP. You might be part of a sister policy that uh, is um, in effect in those particular countries. So uh, the three elements um, that are looked for for this particular type of uh, application of this dispute policy is first is that the domain name must be identical or confusingly similar to the complainant's trademark. Second is that the registrant has no legitimate interest in the domain name. And third is that the domain name is being used in bad faith. And um, when you're looking at these bad faith factors, um, I've, I've got uh, the text here uh, from the policy itself. Um, so um, some of these things, they're not exclusive, uh, but these are certainly some of the factors that, that might uh, indicate bad faith, such as you registered the domain name for the purpose of selling, renting, or otherwise transferring the domain name registration to the owner uh, for uh, you know money in excess of your out-of-pocket costs. Um, Second might be if you register in order to prevent the owner from reflecting the mark in a domain name. Um, it, it's really helpful uh, if you're going for this this particular factor if you can show a pattern of such conduct. So if you can show, uh, you know, that somebody has a not just one but a series of, of domain names, you might be able to prove bad faith using this this particular factor. Um, the third is if you register the domain name primarily for the purpose of disrupting the business of a competitor. Uh, again, this uh, could be used um, if you've got a, a dispute between two direct uh, business entities. And four, um, uh, by using by the domain name, you have uh, attempted to draw people to your own website uh, for the purpose of, of drawing people away from uh, the, um, the complainant's website or by creating a likelihood of confusion as to source, sponsorship, affiliation, or even that somebody uh, might believe that your domain is endorsed by the, by the, by the complainant. And it um, should be noted that uh, the UDRP here is designed to deal with simple cases of cyber squatting, uh, complex fact, matter, fact patterns could simply uh, uh, result in a, in, a, in a panelist believing that uh, the case belongs in litigation instead of uh, in the, in the UD, your UDRP. Uh, it should also be noted that the complainant can choose the forum. Uh, currently there's a choice between three different providers and uh, uh, most have very similar fee structure uh, so um, it, it's they're roughly equivalent in terms of price, although some of them are slightly cheaper than others. Um, but uh, some of them also have what they call supplemental rules, uh, which are worth looking into, uh, especially if you're the complainant, um, because some of them allow you uh, to uh, file additional briefs, um, so which may be advantage if, if you're, you're the complainant. And then uh, remedies um, here are limited to the cancellation or transfer of the domain. Uh, there's no ability to enter any other um, injunction, you know, beyond the domain name itself, or to 
uh, you assert any you know monetary damage award. Now, if you are the respondent in this type of a proceeding, um, uh, you know you're, you're not automatically sunk just because somebody's brought you know this proceeding against you. Um, and so there's you know, ways that are in the policy to show that, in, in fact, you, you actually did have legitimate rights uh, to proceed and, and register the domain name that you that you chose. Um, and one would be uh, your use or your preparation to use uh, the domain name in conjunction with your own offering of goods or services. Or if you, such as the individual or a business, have been commonly known by this domain name, even if you have no uh, provable trademark or service mark rights, uh, you know, if you can show that this is your common name or if your business had been known by this name before that, maybe a, a nickname for, for, you, for you or your or for your company, uh, you know, that, that might be enough. And uh, the third way would be to make a legitimate non-commercial or fair use of the domain name uh, without intent for commercial gain to um, misleadingly divert customers or to tarnish the trademark or service market issue. And, um, you know, those are all certainly ways for a respondent in one of these proceedings uh, to demonstrate their legitimate rights. Um, I should mention as well that the UDRP uh, is an administrative policy um, that uh, is ruled on uh, by a series of panelists in a, a sort of a formal um, um, like a, a formal brief structure. Uh, there's no arguments that are made, uh, no oral arguments, I mean. Uh, instead, everything's ruled on by, by paper. And so there's a complaint that's filed, uh, there's a response, and then it's reviewed by, by the panelist, or it could be a series of panelists if the uh, uh, complainant chose to uh, pay the fee for, uh, for more than one panelist. Um, and uh, it's uh, usually a fair, fairly uh, simple procedure. Um, they usually resolve within two months or less, and um, uh, it's uh, fairly straightforward. Now, the next possibility would be federal litigation over uh, a domain name, and the, there's a, a remedy that's been drafted into the Trademark Act. Um, it's uh, the original bill was called the anti cyber squatting Consumer Protection Act, which is currently codified at uh, 15 U.S.C. 1125D, uh, which is um, uh, again part of the, the the Lanham Act, which is the Trademark Act. Um, some important differences from the UDRP is that it still requires uh, bad faith registration, uh, but does not require use in commerce. And uh, some of the ma major differences, again, is that uh, the remedies include actual or statutory damages of up to $100,000 per domain. And it also provides for in-rem jurisdiction over the domain name itself, which is an important distinction here. Um, I should explain that what we mean by, mean by in-rem jurisdiction would mean you can file a complaint uh, that names the uh, register in, in, in the form of where the registrar exists that says that this particular domain name that's under your control uh, is an infringement of our rights and it's usually required that uh, you, you've reached out to and you've uh, tr attempted to contact uh, the uh, the registrant and uh, you're not able to uh, but you can still bring this proceeding if the if the domain is is uh, subject to this in rem jurisdiction and uh, you know get it transferred. Uh, so the UDRP may be faster, uh, but the anti cyber Squad and Consumer Protection Act has more remedies. Um, it's also important to note that ACPA requires U.S. jurisdiction uh, either over the domain name itself or over the parties. So uh, that, that, that could be uh, important to note uh, if it's a, a domain that, um, uh, you know, there's no cognizable link to the United States, uh, you won't be able to bring to one of these proceedings. So uh, I'm going to, get a, get, going to go ahead and get into some of the hypotheticals I mentioned. Um, each one of these is, uh, you know, worthy of discussion. So um, if anybody has any questions at, at any point, uh, feel free to use uh, the webinar software to go ahead and, and ask questions about these. 
Uh, our first hypothetical is uh, it posits the situation that company A has used its mark happyburger uh, dot com, uh, well, Happy Burger for many years for restaurant services. And in the meantime, company B uh, comes along, re realizes that happyburger.com is available, and so they go ahead and register it uh, to divert traffic to their website, which is normally eataJoes.com. And so um, they may not have an active website itself, but uh, if you go to happyburger.com, you're redirected to eataJoes.com in this hypothetical. And um, uh, this is certainly uh, an example uh, where either the UDRP or the ACPA uh, could um, apply. Uh, we don't say here whether or not uh, Happy Burger uh, Company A has a federal registration, uh, but they certainly have been using it for many years for restaurant services. They certainly have you know, cognizable trademark rights, at least common law rights, that they'd be able to point to. And so um, in this particular situation, um, you know, Company A certainly has plenty of options, and uh, Company B uh, could be facing statutory damages if, um, you know, Company A decides to choose the federal litigation route. Um, it's important to note, though, that, you know, federal litigation is very expensive, and so um, it's probably much more likely that uh, um, Company A may use a different, uh, you know, procedure uh, first, such as either sending a cease and desist letter or, um, you know, proceeding with the UDRP first uh, before deciding whether or not to proceed with the UDRP. Uh, hypothetical two, um, we're going to talk about next is, um, is, is a, a guy by the name of Bob who runs a website exposing the food industry's use of chemicals at sadburger.com. And uh, I get the same company uh, as, as uh, let's say, Company A has finally acquired back HappyBurger.com. And so they're concerned about the impact this may have upon its traffic to its HappyBurger.com domain or uh, impact upon their reputation. And um, uh, this is sort of an interesting hypothetical because uh, I've, I've at least posited a, a, a good example of what might be considered a uh, legitimate non-commercial use of, of, the, of the domain sadburger.com as uh, uh, a site exposing the food industry's uh, use of chemicals. Uh, so it certainly could be a legitimate non-commercial use. Um, and it's also important to note here that, uh, that it's not the identical trademark. It's uh, simply similar to, um, and one could almost say it's commentary, on uh, the, the original uh, happyburger.com domain. And certainly um, uh, both companies could, uh, both, both Bob and Company A could, you know, make arguments on, on both sides of, of that argument here, which is why this is a particularly interesting hypothetical. Okay. If there are no questions, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the third hypothetical. Um, we are going to look at this where uh, Joe is a franchisee of Company A, uh, and he goes ahead and he registers the domain name ChicagoHappyBurger.com in order to have a special website devoted to his particular restaurant location. And um, in our hypothetical, uh, Company A would then request that Joe stop using this domain, but he refuses. And so the real question is, what do you do? Um, and uh, if you're representing Company A, um, one thing that you might want to look at would be, um, you know, what is the agreement in your franchise agreement w uh, with with Joe? There are certainly many franchise agreements these days uh, that include restrictions on what sort of domain names uh, that they may use uh, in commerce. Uh, but if the agreement is silent, um, you know, so there's certainly um, Joe is not your normal cyber squatter in that he does have a legitimate uh, commercial right to identify um, his, his location. Um, but the question would be whether or not he needs, needs to use this particular domain to do so. Um, you know, he could come up with his own website that doesn't necessarily incorpor incorporate the Happerburger potential um, 
uh, potentially, you know, he could uh, have uh, Chicago Burger or, you know, some other variant on that. He doesn't necessarily have to use uh, Happy Burger's, um, you know, trademark to identify the source. Um, and there certainly are, you know, plenty of disputes uh, that we can point to, um, you know, going both ways. Um, these are so fact specific, it's hard to say. But, you know, based on this hypothetical, um, you know, both both uh, Joe and Company A would have good arguments on, on both sides. Now, our fourth hypothetical is um, it's when Company A uh, learns that someone has registered the simple, simple the plural form, happyburgers.com, but all attempts to contact the squatter have failed. And um, it should be noticed that the dot .com registry itself is located in the USA. Um, and, um, and so in this particular instance, you know, what do you do? Um, and uh, you could sort of certainly try the UDRP, um, but um, the, um, the, the, there's, a, there's a chance that, uh, you know, you, you may not get it transferred, um, you know, whereas you can bring under the ACPA, you can bring the um, in REM jurisdiction proceeding against the domain name itself. Um, it should also be noted that uh, uh, that th since the .com registry is located in the USA, um, you know, in theory, uh, pretty much any .com you know domain is uh, theoretically um, liable here under ACPA. Um, it, there's not a guarantee of that, but but it's so certainly a good chance of that. Um, the certainly the federal government itself. Uh, has asserted that position recently, um, it, sort of anecdotally just mentioned uh, uh, the U.S. government has uh, it certainly instituted some procedures recently to uh, seize domains that are used uh, as part of, uh, you know, gambling or other illegal activities as sort of a, a fruits of, um, under the RICO Act. And um, the uh, these ICE seizures that the federal government has been doing, um, a lot of them have been against .com registries and um, network solutions, which is the, the registrar for the .com, uh, you know, so simply uh, won't, won't say how many of these domains that they have uh, seized in, um, you know, over the last few months. Uh, or years, but uh, what what they will say is that that they that that they do comply with um, you know with federal law, and when when faced with a with a proper uh, you know procedure, uh, they will um, you know comply as necessary. Well, uh, looks like I have managed to get through this in about thirty minutes. Um, is uh, this be a good time to point out if uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to use the software and uh, pose your question. Um, and uh, we'll pause here for a second to see if people have questions. Oh, it looks like uh, Fiorentino has a question. Uh, what about redirects like Amazon.com to generate ad hits? Uh, can Amazon take action? Um, I, I deliberately tried not to talk about uh, keywords and and uh, uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, but I, oh, it looks like you're actually talking more about. I, I just realized you're talking about a misspelling. A M Z O N dot com uh, to generate ad hits. Can Amazon take action? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, Amazon cer certainly can. It's uh, it, it's it's no, no requirement that they have the identical domain name string. What's required uh, to bring one of these proceedings is that the, the, the trademark uh, be there in, in some cognizable fashion. It just has to be uh, confusingly similar to, uh, either identical or confusingly similar to the registered mark um, or, or the mark in which they've got common law rights, etc. And in this case, AMZON is confusingly similar to Amazon, and so typo squatting is so certainly something that's envisioned and and uh, you know can, can be brought as part of the UDRP or uh, could be brought under ACPA. Either way. All 
Are there any further questions? Well, I'm not seeing any further questions coming through, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, let people know that uh, a reminder that our next webinar is coming up on April 4th, 2012, on the subject of copyright ownership issues. And if you do have questions um, that you, uh, you know, think of later or uh, upon viewing the recorded version of, the, of this webinar, um, please feel free to contact me at the address below. Um, and also, if you're watching the recorded webinar and uh, would like Illinois MC Lee credit, uh, please contact me and provide me with your name and ARDC number and, um, and let me know how you watch the webinar. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Have a great day.